Has the Republican Party lost its mind and its way in its slavish devotion to Donald Trump, who insists that the 2020 election was stolen from him through extensive voter fraud? That's the question that journalist Robert Draper investigates in his new book, Weapons of Mass Delusion, which looks at rising Republican stars such as Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene and failed Arizona gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake, who are diehard Trump loyalists, and established party leaders such as likely Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy, who is openly terrified to cross the former president. Reason spoke with Draper shortly after the midterm elections in which the GOP had an unexpectedly poor showing against a massively unpopular Joe Biden. Is this a sign that Trump's hold on his party and the country is weakening? And is there any reason to believe that the party of Ronald Reagan and Barry Goldwater may return to its small government roots? Draper also reflects on his 2014 New York Times Magazine cover story, Has the Libertarian Moment Finally Arrived? which prominently featured Reason's Nick Gillespie and Matt Welch. Robert Draper, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me on, Nick. All right. Well, let's uh, start with the elevator pitch of weapons of mass delusion when the Republican Party lost its mind. Sure. This is not a history book. It is a book about a snapshot in time that I believe is of historical significance. Um, and that is uh, a roughly 16 to 18 month period that began with January the 6th, 2021, um, when I was inside the Capitol that day. And um, that moment of madness, it would have seemed to me would have would have been the moment for the Republican Party to descend into a kind of humble meditation, um, take stock of their role in the insur insurrection, and thereupon endeavor to purge the corrosive elements uh, in their party that led to the insurrection. Instead, what they did, of course, was something very different. They doubled down on it, and, um, and the MAGA movement and the disinformation that propelled it uh, became the uh, uh, gravitational center basically, of the Republican Party. This book um, had me doing a deep repertorial dive into the Republican Party during that period. Can I, uh, do you have a politics? Are you a Republican or a Democrat or an independent? I'm a registered you... independent, and I've been that way since I've been an adult. I, my, um, and, and generally speaking, Nick, my, my politics aren't terribly interesting. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm not really an ideologue. I'm more anthropological. I mean, I vote, you know, but, yeah. um, uh, but I've voted for Democrats and Republicans and libertarians with mm -hmm. equal levels of remorse and recrimination, you know, so. <laughs> and in effectiveness, I assume, at least if yes, you're right. voting exactly. for. Um, so let me ask because, or let, let's start with you talk about, um, you know, and, and the book is richly reported. I, I, you're obviously a, uh, you know, a stylist uh, with, you know, without parallel or with few peers uh, writing in long form journalism today. Um, so um, it's it's great to read on, a, you know, just on that level. But on uh, I think it's page 199 or 195 or thereabouts. You talk about three lies, um, and within within weeks of the insurrection, of the riot at the Capitol building, you say the chain of lies had come to form a perfect circle. The first lie, the big lie, was that the election was stolen. The second lie was that the steel could be unstolen on January 6th, whether through legal or extra-legal means. And the third and final lie was that those who attempted to unsteal it were in fact not Trump supporters. And I kind of want to walk through those real quick, and then I want to talk about some of the characters. Because, um, you know, the, I mean, the subtitle of your book is When the Republican Party Lost Its Mind. We are dealing with a lack of engagement with, you know, uh, with reality on the part of this party, or at least a, a significant portion of it. Let's start with the big lie that the election was stolen. And that starts even before the 2020 election, right? But it does. how, I mean, how did it. that come into being? And that is mostly Trump kind of promoting that front and center. It is with a but that comes after that. But first to address the Trump aspect of it. I mean, we're talking about a guy who simply stated has been a sore loser all his mm -hmm. life. And whenever he has lost it, something, he's a sore he's winner. To, 
as well. Yeah. I mean, he's just, yeah, <laughs> well, that's yeah. true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's no, there's no grace to the guy. Um, but whenever he has lost, he's tended to blame someone else. Mm-hmm. The very first political contest he was in, you'll recall, Nick was the Iowa caucus of 2016. He mm-hmm. lost to Ted Cruz. He claimed that Cruz had rigged it. He mm-hmm. subsequently did that with the Wyoming and Colorado caucuses, and in the run up to the 26 election, said, you know, if um, uh, Hillary's going to try to rig it against me, yeah. even as you point out, when he did win. He still said he, he would have won New Hampshire, but for the rigging that supposedly took place. Yeah. So and and so that that's that's been Trump's game for a while. But it played into two things, and it took me a while to appreciate um, these two other elements. One was that the this lie, the notion that if the Democrats win in twenty twenty, it would only be because they stole it, played into a longstanding view amongst Republicans. The Democrats steal. They they cheat all the time. And it's and you can talk to run of the mill Republicans throughout the decades, and this is what they've been told, and they accept it the way they casually accept that Hillary Clinton is a crook. Um, and so calling her crooked Hillary may not have been a polite company way to say it, but it just been widely assumed, absent, however, any indictment, much less a conviction, that, right. that Clinton um, was a crook. So that's one thing that um, Trump was tapping into, whether he was aware of it or not at the time. But the broader um, uh, thing that, that Trump tapped into with his stolen election claims was a sense of loss, a sense of forfeiture on the part of large swaths of non-college educated white working class Americans who believed that America as they knew it was being stolen from them bit by bit. And so uh, that um, their champion um, had been uh, that his victory had been thwarted through um, ill-gotten gains, uh, fed metaphorically and in all other meaningful ways into this notion that um, that the rightful owners of America were having their America stolen from them. So those are you know the subtexts of Trump's outrageous claims, and I think why it is the tens of millions of people bought into yeah. those claims. Because I, I was uh, in preparation for this, I was looking up, it's still, you know, they're not asking, pollsters aren't asking this question as much as they used to, but going back to earlier this year, something like 70% of Republicans still say that Joe Biden was not fairly elected. And right. that could mean yeah, a lot yeah. of things. But it's also true that, you know, it wasn't just Trump in the 2016 election I can recall both Hillary and Trump saying, you know what, the system is rigged. The system isn't working. The system is rigged. Bernie Sanders would say that in a more, particularly in 2016, it was more in a class thing that, you know, uh, the capitalists or, or, you know, the fat cats, the 1%, the system is rigged against you, you know, the normal working class person. Trump's version of that is much more overblown and more, seems more targeted or was more targeted towards this kind of sense of dispossessed white people, mostly men, not always, uh, mm-hmm. and increasing, I guess in 2020, le- less white than previously, right? I mean, so yeah. it's yeah. part, I mean, and I think that's important, and I, you, you kind of touch on that in the book, this sense of being dispossessed by large overarching conspiracies is kind of not quite the right word, but systems that don't give a shit about you, and you're done. And, you know, Trump, taps into that, right? That's part of what he's speaking to. That's right. I mean, of course, it was ironic that, um, you know, it it always seemed a bit dubious from the outset that this billionaire (laughs) real estate developer from Manhattan could be the champion (laughs) of the working class. But the way he sold himself to people who Mm -hmm. lived in states like South Carolina and Georgia that Trump only knew from the golf courses there was by um, sharing the same enemies with them. You know, right. that's that's how uh, I think he whetted their appetite for him by by talking about how China had screwed them over, yeah. how um, how the government had basically given away the store in these trade deals, how the border was wide open and people were taking these things from them. And so uh, after a while, they they loved um, they loved that language that Trump mm-hmm. was was speaking. They loved as well how he would say it and take whatever slings and arrows came his way. And so I think those were the two um, overlapping elements that, that, um, uh, that made Trump the guy when it seemed so unlikely that he would be that individual. Yeah. And um, 
But then there comes this moment on election night. I mean, because part of it is, you know, Trump uh, in 2020, you know, when the election, when the, the poll shut down because of, you know, it's late in the night, he's kind of ahead the popular vote or whatever. But everybody knows there are tons of votes to be counted because of early voting, mail-in voting, all of that kind of stuff. And then, I mean, Trump obviously, obviously goes with this, but so do a lot of people who should know better to say that, right. you know, if Trump, you know, he's the winner on election night when not all the votes have been counted because a lot of them have been cast weeks ahead of time and won't be counted until weeks after. But if he's not declared the winner, then it's fraud. Um, right. Who, you know, who are the progenitors of that kind of mindset? And, um, you know, that seems to take over in a big way, too. Sure. And I and I think that hard to, hard to say who's the absolute first who came up with that notion. Um, but we do know some people who acted on that notion, some people who are the great amplifiers mm -hmm. of, of that notion. And, um, you know, for example, a, a right wing congressman from Arizona named Paul Gosar, mm -hmm. who uh, had um, hosted the first uh, Stop the Steal rally which happened to be in Phoenix the day after the election. Gosar, like a lot of Republicans, was relying entirely on experience. And, and Nick, I feel like you and I have had conversations more or less around this before about the big sort and about um, how people have become isolated and, and um, uh, uh, not only geographically, but also in terms of the information they gravitate towards, that there is uh, basically an information outlet that fits anyone's biases. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so what this would mean for a Paul Gosar is that all they knew were Republicans and that when Gosar actually went door to door canvassing in Arizona to get people to vote for Trump, he would say, um, and his chief of staff told me about this, that, you know, I didn't meet any Biden voters. They just simply didn't exist. So right. it just simply made no sense that this guy could come up with so many votes. And flash forward to um, a person we'll likely get to in a few minutes, um, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. I was having dinner with Greene a month ago, something like this. And, and um, she said to me, Robert, I had said to her that she was delusional about the 2020 election. Yeah. And, and uh, um and she said, Robert, you mean to tell me, do you do you really believe that Joe Biden got 81 million votes? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what you yeah. got. That's that that's the organizing principle of the of, of your conspiracy theory that because you can't imagine this. But in fact, that played a big role in it, that um, everyone she knew was a Trump supporter. Every uh, every time, especially in 2020, that there was a crowd, it was a crowd for Donald Trump. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Biden and other people weren't campaigning because of COVID, and and uh, and it it just was too stupefying a notion for yeah. them. You and come then, but again then with, at the same time they would say, and but Trump got seventy four million votes. He got more votes than he had the first right. time. He had yeah. to have won if his vote totals went up. But then we we're not going to count. I mean, there's so much magical thinking that the yeah. same system that seems to tabulate Trump's votes doesn't count when it's counting up Biden's votes. It also, it, you know, it also fails to recognize that Trump, you know, was a walking anomaly anyway. In yeah. 2016, um, he came seemingly out of nowhere. He didn't win the popular vote, but he still, yeah. he, he won a lot. And uh, in defiance of what pollsters and pundits mm -hmm. had imagined he would do, but that was because a lot of people couldn't stand Hillary Clinton and mm -hmm. were willing to take a chance on this disruptor. Yeah. It, it, why th that would, you know, um, uh, be so bizarre for them to recognize the possibility that this same anomaly would, um, uh, uh, that independents and other swing voters would ultimately find that experiment to be a bad one, would find right. it to be distasteful and would move away towards this very boring guy um, because they decided to go for Operation Boring over Operation, mm -hmm. you know, Chaos. And, right. and uh, um, that the, the anomaly worked for them before and didn't work for the second time doesn't, ex doesn't erase the fact that Trump was going to live and die, you know, by his own anomalous characteristics. Um, you know, the second part then, the second lie is that the vote, you know, the stolen election could be turned yeah. back. Um, and that leads us to January 6th. And, the, uh, you know, I tend to call it a riot, not an insurrection. Um, your uh, your um, 
kind of depiction of it from inside and using different sources really amazing and powerful. And I, if uh, people don't read the full book, read that because it's it's a really vivid account of you know of the violence that was going on. It's not not yeah. You know, I mean, it is a mob. It's a mob generally without weapons. I mean, they're not shooting guns, but. There's a lot of violence there. And if you, you know, for people who took seriously riots that came out of uh, Black Lives Matter marches or other kinds of things, like you really got to, you know, you you got to read this part of the book and and take this seriously. Um, but the, talk about where the idea came that if somehow, you know, if Mike Pence, if uh, you know, said magic words or that there was, you know, I mean, because did anybody really believe that, you know, the uh, QAnon shaman was going to take over the Capitol building and then the, you know, Trump would somehow become president. Like, where did that theory, which is totally fabulous, you know, or, you know, it's, it's just fantastical that you could stop the election of Joe Biden by doing something with, you know, the Capitol building on January 6th. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, to the extent that there is a unifying theory in all of this, Nick, that the unifying theory was in MAGA world, Trump is our champion. He won. Um, uh, victory was stolen from him. He has said, come to DC, uh, we'll be wild. Mm -hmm. uh, he has done everything for us. The only things he, he's asked for us is two things, first to vote and, and now to come to Washington and fight like hell, as he would say, on January the 6th. And uh, But I think beyond that kind of consensus view, um, there then get to be these, these, you know, when you disaggregate it, there's certainly people who showed up believing, and, and probably this, this constitutes the majority of people who just showed up saying, you know, we want to support our president. And, and when I was there and outside the Capitol, um, there were a lot of elements that looked like a standard issue MAGA rally of which I've attended, you know, 15 or something like that. There was another group of people, smaller, <laughs> but um, but still pretty large, who believed that um, we need to do something beyond support. We need to take our country back. And you know, if if you believed as these people did that democracy had been thwarted, had been weaponized against them, um, then uh, you'd want to take action. And and I think most of those people came to the Capitol, not entirely sure what form that would take, but they were the ones who constitute the real mob, where mm -hmm. the third smallest subsection of all are the violent actors who came, you know, with um, with the intent, uh, with, with insurrection on the brain, and, you mm -hmm. know, the Oath Keepers, uh, 5%, et cetera. And, and, uh, um, but they couldn't have done it without a mob. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, those were the people that I heard outside the Capitol once I got outside the building and um, who were like this guy I heard talking to his teenage son saying, you know, son's free, freedom isn't free. Sometimes you have to fight for it like our forefathers did. And I think now is that time. And they disappeared towards the building. I don't know what mm -hmm. the hell happened to them after that. But it's but as I was among this kind of pulsing mob, the the sense that I had was this is absolutely out of control. And um and violence, once there is an obvious target, is the obvious conclusion of right. this. There turned out not to be an obvious target, but had there been a Mike Pence nearby, had there been a Nancy Pelosi, yeah. an AOC, or any, I mean, God help them, you know? And yeah. uh, um, it is a miracle, in fact, you know, and also a feat of, of capital security um, that there was not more bloodshed that day. But then kind of the larger legal theories and stuff like that, because you still hear, uh, um, you know, and I, I mean, a variety of uh, not a variety, a majority of Republicans did not certify the elections. Right. right. Uh, the election yeah. results. Did they I mean, do those people think, you know, by not signing on that they're going to change the election result or are they just kind of. Showing solidarity with, you know, Il Supremo, Donald Trump, or right. Know. Well, so absent, you know, absent a thorough survey of all of them, yeah. no such survey exists. I can only conjecture based on the interviews that I've done, and that's that there were some who truly believed funny business was afoot, and an absolute minimum there needed to be a pause on the process so that um, uh, we could look into all of this stuff. Uh, but I would say a significant majority of Republicans who voted um, uh, to, to not to certify were ones who were scared shitless, frankly. They, mm -hmm. and, and who were they scared of? They were scared of their constituents, you know, and, and uh, in real time. And I mentioned this in, in my book, a, a freshman 
from Michigan named Peter Meyer, Mm -hmm. uh, who would subsequently vote to impeach and would subsequently be successfully primaried and bounced from office. Uh, you know, after one term, was getting these texts from donors and other constituents saying, hey, don't wimp out. You know, don't let a few broken windows scare you from doing the right thing here. And, 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 and that is when we ask the question, so why did, you know, all these Republicans who seem to believe because they experienced it firsthand um, that something terrible had taken place that we as a democracy um, needed to turn away from, why did they turn away from that notion, the short answer is they went home. They went home and listened to their constituents. But in but in even in those days leading up to January the sixth, um, you know, their belief then and later was um uh, and I heard this I, I can't count how many times I heard this, Nick, from Republicans who would say, look, you know, if I object, um uh then I'll get primaried. If I get primaried to the right of me, I'll probably lose. If I lose, that person who comes to office will be Marjorie Taylor Greene. Do you right. want another one of those? Or, or, or would in you just Myers, go to ground? Yeah, or in Myers district. And he replaced Amash, Justin Amash, who, you know, the Republican right. who became an independent, voted to impeach Trump, became libertarian before right. not running for re-election because he knew he was going to be primaried that right. time by Peter Meyer, who then got primaried by a Trump. John candidate Gilles, right? who yeah. yeah who was you know just ridiculous and now that district is gone right yeah so exactly. it's yeah. it's, so, it's so, not so even yeah, like Hillary you get a trump person yeah it's it's very right. um peculiar so then the, the final part of this lie which and this is where reality really takes kind of a permanent vacation which is you have many of the people who were implicated in january 6 and some you know some politicians saying well you know what like January 6th was a bad thing, but it wasn't Trump supporters and Donald Trump didn't have anything to do with it because it was Antifa or it was a false flag operation by the FBI and the CIA and, you know, the, uh, you know, the PTA or something. Where is that coming from? And is, does that have serious legs or is that just the worst kind of people who know they're, they're guilty of something, uh, even if it's just bad thinking, you know, just want to try and make something go away? Well, I think that where it, it really comes from is um, a, uh, a right-wing media ecosystem that knows that this stuff sells and has become a cottage industry. Um, the whole January 6th political persecution is itself, you know, a cottage mm-hmm. industry. But you're referring, Nick, specifically, you know, to this guy, Alan Hostetter, who, um, interesting story, a guy who um, had been a police chief in a town in Orange County, California, mm-hmm ultimately left, became a yoga instructor, not very political at all. Then the pandemic hits. Um, he becomes radicalized by all of that and becomes a big stop the steal proponent. Uh, when Trump does his, you know, uh, come to Washington, will be wild. Hmm. Hostetter starts recruiting people to this task and, and, uh, and on social media saying that violence is the likely outcome and he's, he's here for it. You know, time to string people up, try, time to execute the tre- treasonous people. He, um, participates uh, in January the 6th. He's, um, he is ultimately uh, indicted for that and is still awaiting trial. But in the interim, before he was actually indicted, he started a podcast in which he calls the insurrection the fake insurrection and says that this was all an FBI setup and yeah. um, possibly using violent actors like Antifa. I mean, here he is like just elaborately contradicting everything that he had stood for and espoused mm-hmm. Uh, very vocally and memorialized on so- social media. So, um, uh, and and meanwhile, you know, flash forward later, um, there are still some detainees in January um, in the DC jail awaiting mm-hmm. um, trial for January six related offenses, and uh, and they are all now being cast as political um, as politically persecuted, mm-hmm. and the cottage industry supporting that movement. There are all these offshoot groups as well as, you know, the gateway pundit types right. um, are, yeah, are, are now saying that take your pick. It was either um, Antifa who did all this or it was the FBI. It's, it, it, the latter becomes a little complicated because the FBI did have informants, you know, that's right. in, inside there. But it, but none of that's the, the likelier OCAM's ra- uh, razor <laughs> explanation is that right. the FBI, as the FBI's want to do, the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing, yeah. and um, because the evidence is fairly clear that these guys were um, astonishingly flat-footed um, when January the sixth 
arose. But uh, but but so um, but there's enough doubt. And let's face it, almost every conspiracy theory begins with some mm-hmm. kernel of truth or some yeah. you know question that that does beg answering, um, but maybe not in such a you know delusional way. Yeah, and I mean, th- in a lot of ways, I feel like we're we're living in a Thomas Pinchon novel, like The Crying of Lot Forty Nine or something, where. You know, the FBI, we know the FBI is a terrible agency, Um, you know, both the left and the right and increasingly the mainstream can agree on that. FBI informants were somehow involved in, you know, this, the plot to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the, the governor of Michigan. If you read anything about the FBI history, you know, they're terrible, but we now have gotten to a point where it's like, you know, reality is so fungible to people's needs and desires in a given moment. And I think, it's worth going back to that larger point, you know, that, uh, that you made at the beginning that one of the reasons why Trump spoke to so many people, uh, you know, and he got 46% of the popular vote in two presidential elections. That's a large chunk of people is there are people who feel in desperate straits. They feel left behind. They feel, um, uh, you know, unseen and, um, you know, and these kinds of stories bubble out when there aren't good explanations or nobody's reaching out. Let's talk about, you know, if if your book has three characters in Trump, and I guess I, you know, for all five of the crying of lot 49 readers who might be out there, if Trump <laughs> is kind of the Pierce in of this, uh, of your book, he's kind of the looming shadowy overlord who every is, makes everything happen, but is not really seen very much. Um, the, the three main villains, I would argue, are the characters in your book are Paul Goser, who you've mentioned, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and, uh, Kevin McCarthy. And I want to go through each of them a little bit. You mentioned Gosar. He is a dentist who's a congressman from Arizona. And it was funny when you were talking about him writing, and I, I, you know, I knew the name and everything, but then when I looked him up, I was expecting, somebody who is 95 years old and, you know, had been a Bircher, like when the Birch Society started, et cetera. He's born in 1958. He's got, you know, he's got his hair still has color in it and he looks kind of normal. But who is Paul Goser and why is he so central to what you're writing about in Weapons of Mass Delusion? Sure. My interest in Gosar um, precedes this book because he came in with a Tea Party class in 2010, mm-hmm. and um, I wrote a book about that class. I interviewed Gosar in 2011, just shortly after he took office, and I found him to be just breathtakingly uninteresting and figured mm-hmm. that uh, here's a guy we'll never hear from again. He'll probably you know, be a one- or two-termer maximum through flu, redistricting, et cetera. Um, he managed to last – but he became significant on a couple of levels to me. Um, first, because, uh, as mentioned, um, as unremarkable a character as he was, he um, not only started the Stop the Steal uh, movement uh, vis-a-vis the rallies, um, but he also played this rather remarkable moment in being the first congressman who joined with a U.S. senator to formally object to the certification of electoral votes of a particular state, in this case, his own state, Arizona, um, which led to this debate that then was interrupted by the rioters. The second thing, though, is that um, Gosar uh, is, um, Gosar is, you you mentioned a John Bircher, and that's a really apt characterization. I think that, that in a earlier era, that's precisely what he would have been, and he would have been purged from the party as a result. But we see instead, um, uh, we'll get to Kevin McCarthy in yeah. a minute, but but leadership's utter inability to punish someone like Gosar, and in fact, to defend Gosar. And, and the reason that, um, that McCarthy and others defended Gosar was not because they liked him, they didn't, but because if they didn't defend him, they would incur the wrath of the MAGA movement that essentially is the, um, uh, the, the, the base of the Republican Party. And uh, the other thing interesting about Gosar is that for all of Gosar's weirdness, he's also tried to be a real legislator, mm-hmm. begging the question, can you say all of this crazy shit and then be taken seriously um, uh, you know, when you're trying to get bills passed? And, and uh, the question probably answers itself, but I, you know, the, the reporting that I do shows how people who might have even been sympathetic to some of his saner legislative initiatives basically aren't going to sign on and be a co-sponsor with a guy who refuses to call Joe Biden President Biden because he says he's illegitimate and calls him Mr. Biden instead. 
Are there echoes in that, uh, just very briefly, in terms of refusing to recognize, you know, Biden as president? Um, how, is, is there a line to be drawn uh, that's meaningful from when George W. Bush was selected as president by the Supreme Court or by, you know, a few hundred or thousand voters in Florida? And there was a period when Democrats refused to, you know, I mean, they accepted that it was president, but they pushed on that, that he wasn't legitimate in the way that Bill Clinton had been or that Barack Obama would be. Well, certainly that's a line, a connective tissue that a lot of Republicans would like mm -hmm. to see us all accept. But I do think that scattered protests, disgruntlements and sword losing is not the same thing as refusing to recognize the legitimacy yeah. of a president. I mean, being pissed off about it, saying that voters were suppressed, saying that um, your brother helped fix the election in Florida, mm -hmm. you know, that's, um, is, is one thing. But being steadfast in your insistence that this guy um, doesn't belong in the White House and should never be addressed by his title is, I think, something else. Yeah. And um, with Gosar, you talk about how he, um, in a way that is uh, emblematic of something, I mean, he was playing footsie with white nationalists in a way that certainly under George W. Bush, um, uh, you know, that that would have been grounds for being canned from the Republican Party or whatnot. But talk about Gosar's connections to, um, you know, kind of white nationalists, white supremacists, and how that is being tolerated in a way that it wouldn't have been, you know, 20 years ago. Sure. Well, I mean, it, it starts with the fact that um, whether anyone likes it or not, and a lot of Republicans don't like it, a lot of Republican, you know, responsible Republicans, um, white nationalists are a not insignificant part of the Republican base. That's just a fact. I'm not saying they're a majority, but I'm mm -hmm. saying that that's, you know, um, when you're trying to amass a following amongst the base, uh, there is the temptation amongst those on the right to court um, white nationalists, or at least wink, you know, wink and mm -hmm. nudge at them. But the, the Gosar explanation for speaking to the America First PAC uh, led by Nick Fuentes, who was just an unapologetic white mm -hmm. supremacist and, and very, very anti-Semitic, among other, you know, uh, other things one can say about Fuentes, is that um, this was a, this was um, a group of uh, young um, conservatives who were in search of a leader, basically. Marjorie Taylor Greene would say the same thing to me, too. It's uh, that um, uh, um, these were uh, a bunch of mainly, you know, um, white males uh, who represented, in a sense, um, uh, the next generation of conservatism. And uh, you, you want to cultivate those people. You don't necessarily want to uh, uh, humor some of their baser, notions, um, but you also don't want to condemn them either. So mm -hmm. that was Gosar's rationale for doing this. And and that and a certain amount of ignorance that, oh, I had no idea that Fuentes mm -hmm. said these things. Also, he's Gosar's chief of staff, Tom Van Flyn, said to me, look, you know, he's a kid. You know, I did a lot of stupid things when I was 25 mm -hmm. years old, too. But, you know, I, I would hope that those didn't include saying, you know, um, the numbers don't add up about 6 million Jews being, mm -hmm. you know, executed in, in Nazi Germany, for example. Um, well, let's talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, because she, I mean, in a, in a lot of ways, part of the argument of your book on, on some level is that Marjorie Taylor Greene is not a fringe element of the Republican Party. She represents quite possibly the future of the Republican Party. Um, who is Marjorie Taylor Greene and why is she important in talking about when the Republican Party lost its mind. Yeah, I mean, three and a half years ago, um, if you asked me those questions, yeah, we, we would wonder why we're having a conversation about her at all. She was, she and her husband uh, owned a successful family uh, construction business in, um, in the, the suburbs of Atlanta. Uh, she um, uh, was a conservative, but not politically active until 2018 when she uh, embraced the QAnon conspiracy theory and around that time became uh, a right-wing social media influencer. Uh, she started going to Washington in 2019 uh, to harass Democrats, to um, increase her social media following, but also to implore Republicans to pass, uh, to, to uh, block gun safety legislation. She couldn't get an audience with any of these Republicans she wanted to see. It really pissed her off. And so 
here's this, you know, millionaire conservative who's saying, hey, I'm a taxpayer. And these people refuse to uh, even grant me an audience. Screw them. I'm going to run. And she ran a kind of what seemed like a flukish campaign. They were, people took her seriously because she had enough money to self fund. Mm-hmm. Um, but then through the luck of um, the draw, uh, a new district opened up in Georgia when um, the Republican incumbent decided to retire. She moved in there, super conservative, uh, uh, rural northwestern uh, Georgia district. And she won convincingly. But along the way, all of these QAnon and other racially and in many other ways offensive um, posts came to light. And the assumption, Nick, was when she arrived in Washington that the Republicans would kick her to the curb. She would be at the Star Wars bar where Steve King of Iowa had once been, and she'd be out after a term or so. Instead, um, uh, the the most remarkable um, opposing trajectories occurred of two uh, female Republicans, Liz Cheney, the most prominent uh, Republican woman in in, uh, American politics, um, uh, her, her career spiraled and she became exiled from the party where Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, without changing any of her views, right. uh, became, as you're saying, um, you know, in a lot of ways, central to the party and one of its most potent me- uh, messengers. What are the you know, what are two or three of the most insane things that Marjorie Taylor Greene has publicly said or believes? So are you talking about pre-congressional career or since let's, she's become? Let's uh, do one before and one or two after. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the you know the QAnon stuff that included that California wildfires were the result of um, uh, a space laser shot from the skies by uh, a company owned by the wealthy Jewish billionaire Rothschild family. Um, that one's pretty out there. Uh, uh, but also just <laughs> casual stuff like she would say um, in in one of her posts that. Um, you know, I don't know why black Americans get so bent out of shape looking at these Confederate statues or, you know, uh, or, you know, um, statues of slaveholders. I mean, if I'd, I'd be proud to walk past them because that would just show me how far I've come. I mean, it, that, those kinds of things. But um, but since she has come in office, uh, her uh, um, her claims that members of uh, the Democratic members such as Jamie Raskin um, are. Uh, card-carrying communists that mm-hmm. they're um, uh, and her saying as well that um, Repu- or Democrats want Republicans dead and the killings have already begun uh, are um, themselves kind of straight out of QAnon viewing yeah. the other side as incorrigibly evil. So uh, that's a thumbnail sketch. But when we can go on and on. And I mean, you mentioned that you had dinner with her. Um, you know, is she when you're talking to her and you're saying like, "Hey, you know, pass the butter." Is she like that or is, I mean, how much of this no. is an act? How much of this is real? Um, maybe that doesn't matter, but I mean, like what, it, what no, she no, like are, to, to share a cab Yeah, with? yeah. Two overlapping questions you, you posed there. So first as to, you know, um, sort of what she's like, and then we'll get to what she believes, right? And, um, as to what she's like, um, uh, fairly normal, you know, at mm-hmm. first blush. If you saw her and didn't know who she was and just – were conversing with her about, you know, the weather or football or something like that, you'd find her to be instantly recognizable as a standard issue, Southern um, uh, conservative woman, you know, that's uh, uh, of a certain affluence. And, and, um, uh, uh, and, and I must say in the many times now that I spent with Green, she, I think, has made a concerted effort to impress upon me that she's normal, that her mm-hmm. views are much more mainstream than I think. Um, and and by the way, I should say that kind of works both ways because her, I'm the first member of the mainstream media to spend time with her. And, and certainly- um, You may well other. be the last as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Actually, you'd be, you would yeah. be surprised. I mean, I think that, that um, uh, I mean, we can get to the topic if you want, but as she, you know, um, uh, this is the kind of, psychic um um you know bridge that she had to cross the psychic rubicon that that that, um because her assumption was that we were all evil you know that we're like you know um we're but she failed to detect any sulfur fumes i think Mm -hmm. when she sat down and met with me i have a southern accent like her and Mm -hmm. and uh, uh and the the seeming normalcy you know kind of plays both ways as to what she believes um the short answer is to the question how much of this does she believe is 
she believes enough of it. She, mm-hmm. she also willfully hyperbolizes. She knows that, that that's what sells. That's mm-hmm. what gets you attention. And this is an attention economy in yeah. which she's playing. Um, but at her core, yes, she does believe that Democrats are, if they're not Luciferian, then they're basically um, they're destroying America. She does yeah. believe that, and and uh, uh, and um, and I think you know when it comes to this sort of existential situation that she embraces, that that really you know uh, we're in a war for the soul of America. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what's a little exaggeration, even a little outright lying. Uh, when the stakes are so great. Yeah. And, you know, this is probably beyond your uh, expertise, but, you know, fuck it, answer it if you would <laughs> like anyway. I mean, she's interesting also because you mentioned QAnon and QAnon, mm-hmm. among other things, and this is the idea that a deep state actor is kind of speaking truth about all of the horrors that are in the government, including the idea that many Democrats um, and other world leaders are pedophiles, cannibals. I mean, like, it's not simply, you know, the Bilderbergers run everything in, uh, behind the, the scenes or, you know, that Jews control the media or anything like that. I mean, it's like that plus a serious dose of, you know, kind of where it comes from. I don't know, pedophilia, like fears or, you know, of that. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a former Catholic who says the Catholic Church is a pedophile organization. There, right. You know, there, you, we, one can understand that that comes out of, you know, the churches, the, the priest scandals and things like that. But do you have a sense of in MAGA world? Um, it does seem that, you know, that charge of pedophilia, I mean, which is, you know, it's one thing to call your, you know, to call Nancy Pelosi evil or, you know, John Podesta evil. And I'm now starting to wonder if this is maybe it has something to do with them being Catholic and Italian, but not just that they're evil, but that they're pedophiles and that they are right. tormenting and killing and sexually abusing children and then eating them. What is, I mean, does that make sense when you go through MAGA world? Why the turn to pedophilia? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll say, by the way, that Green, I think, not only renounces QAnon, but is genuinely ashamed that mm-hmm. she took it as far as she did. But as to how she got sucked into it to begin with, um, it 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 helped make vivid um, for uh, people like her who um, who didn't understand why Democrats were so dismissive, so heedless, so contemptuous. Um, uh, uh, that th- th- they were in fact evil, you know, it's, uh, this, that's a rather bizarre, you know, and garish manifestation of it, but at least it would explain why don't you care enough about children? Um, the other thing too, that QAnon, I think, um, was, uh, how it became so appealing to so many people was the op- was the other side of the ledger, which is the heroism of, um, not just their fearless leader, Donald Trump valiantly fighting this pedophilia ring. But how everyone who supported Donald Trump was a patriot, mm-hmm. and um, and th- this conferred on them a, a real goodness, um, a warrior status, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and an unqualified rightness. Uh, and so, to cast the stakes in this comic book, you know, this garish comic book fashion, um, becomes, if not more sensible, at least just irresistible for individuals who want to feel of themselves that way. Yeah. And and Green said to me, you know, that she she said, look, you'd you'd be surprised how, you know, the, the people who are involved in QAnon, like lots of affluent people, lots of successful yeah. people in business. Jeffrey, you know, and Jeffrey then, Epstein and the whole, you know, everybody at MIT and Harvard and, you know, right. flying to his island and all of that. No, sure. And 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 she, you know, when I asked her, why did you keep all that stuff up, you know, your social mm-hmm. media stuff, the crazy shit from the past when you were running for office, why didn't you scrub all this? And she, I remember, I'll never forget her response. It was like, I didn't think it would hurt, hurt me. In fact, yeah. I kind of thought it would help me. Mm. And like, that's, that was a mind blower to me, but I have to say she was onto something, you know, it's yeah. um, like even people who, you know, weren't into QAnon could still sympathize with the fundamental views, right? That, mm-hmm. that the opposite side was evil. And the, right. their side uh, was locked in this, you know, kind of clash of good versus evil. I mean, Carrie and, Lake, you know, said that yeah. out loud. This is about right. good versus evil. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess the stake, you know, one of the things I'm trying to understand in, in a larger context is someone who I just don't viscerally understand Republicans or Democrats. Uh, you know, and I, I mean, it's not, a, it's a 
it's a lack in me, but on the on the liberal or democratic side, so you you see people use the idea that the world is about to end. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, like what was it in two thousand eighteen? We were told we have you know twelve years to fix global warming, otherwise the the world is over. But you know, right. both sides in different ways, and I'm not making a, a you know a false equivalencies here, I but understand. like both sides are. You know, and it reminds me of growing up in the 70s. The world is about to end, you know, whether through, you know, fire or ice. But and on the right, it has taken this form of like this is a cataclysm and it's almost like, you know, Jesus is coming back. And, you know, have you do you have the mark of the beast on you or not? Like, have did you stand up? Are you going to be raptured or are you going to be okay? And it just, you know, where those stakes come from is kind of. Yeah, I'm. I'm still trying to figure that out in a way. Well, it's it, well. So it's you know, Nick, you and I, you know, for the sake of your listeners, um, met each other in 2014 when yeah. I was doing a story about libertarianism, and you know, when we and, and we talked a lot about whether or not the libertarian moment had arrived in 2014. Mm-hmm. Short answer, no. But yes, it's, uh, but but one it made it to the it, cover. That question has the libertarian yeah. movement finally arrived. <laughs> Written by you, that story made it to the New York Times Magazine. Cover, cover and I but, and I never answered the question. Yeah, the no, story. and I, and you know the joke is that when a trend hits the New York Times, it's officially over. So I guess right. that's what happened to the. It's kind of like the Sports Illustrated. You yeah. know, when, when you're a team yeah. on Sports Illustrated, you're going to lose, and it's yeah. and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, or get an ACL or something. Right. But but yeah, I um but but I but in pondering, so what happened to whatever libertarian energy yeah. there was, and that was like a a healthy distrust of government and a belief that, you know, um, that uh, the less government, the better, which has a spectrum of, of quasi, you know, anarchy to, you know, Rand Paul or something, mm-hmm. um, that, that something happened. And, and the evangelical movement explains some of this. And I think mm-hmm. conspiracy theorizing is an overlap, because when you and I were talking, Jade Helm was happening. It's right. um, Operation Jade Helm, which was, um, you know, briefly, uh, a, a real military operation, a military exercise taking place in a bunch of southern and western states that f- through a series of circumstances, um, some people on the right began to believe was a military, a true military operation being conducted by Obama to seize people's guns, to kill off conservatives, etc. And, um, and so there is a fundamental difference between thinking you know, government's not good and government is evil. Right. Government is Luciferian. And and something happened um, that whatever libertarian energy there was, was overtaken by this eschatological notion of yeah. government. That, and and that of course, augur the end of the world. Yeah. And, and they overlap because uh, Ron Paul, who certainly, uh, you know, provided a ton of the libertarian energy was a big Jade Helm guy. And he always has yeah. trafficked in conspiracy theories that NAFTA was going to lead to, uh, you know, and it's confusing. I mean, conspiracy theories rarely kind of are, are succinct or stable, but NAFTA was going to lead to a super highway from Mexico to Canada, which somehow would lead to more immigrants coming here, even though you could drive from, you know, Juarez to Ottawa or something in like 10 hours, uh, you know, but um, so that, you know, the conspiracy theory <clears throat> the religious fervor and the belief of end times are all kind of wrapped up. And, and I have to say, you know, you'd be, you know, much more adept at, at, at figuring this out than me. But, but the reality that I've stumbled upon in my reporting is that there, that a lot of these more anti-democratic um, hard right people in places like Arizona and Georgia uh, were originally Ron Paul followers. And, yeah. you know, for example, Marjorie Taylor Greene's, um, uh, top strategist, this guy named Isaiah Wartman, um, was a Ron Paul person. Mm-hmm. And uh, in Arizona, people who, and, and this is also true in Wyoming too, the people who came out, you know, very early against Liz Cheney, um, the movement, the anti-democratic movement on the far right in Arizona and in Wyoming, again, these people were, for whatever reason, they first found their home right. in Ron Paul, and they migrated over to the anti-democratic climbs of this other movement. So let's, and I want to talk about Kevin McCarthy because I think he's the true yeah. problem in, in, in many ways because yeah. he's, you know, kind of the adult in the room who is just like the worst, most absentee parent one could imagine. But so I, I just want to dilate on this a little bit. You know, you have Georgia, which is an interesting state where it, it, you know, it was red for a long time. It is now, 
you know, it's a mix of red and blue. And we're, we're seeing something interesting happen there. Arizona, you know, on the other side of the country, also in the southern region, is kind of similar where, you know, Arizona defined a kind of Goldwater conservatism or, you know, Goldwater defined Arizona as in such a place. And now you're seeing in Arizona, um, you know, this same kind of thing where it's it's not really purple, but there are hardcore blue people and hardcore red people um, and they're clashing like they're not mixing. They're clashing. Um, what's going on in Arizona and this, you know, well, we can talk about the midterms kind of along the way, but um, it's you wrote a fantastic piece for the New York Times about the Arizona GOP and it was built. This came out in August. It was about Carrie Lake. Talk a little bit about her and where she comes from. And if Marjorie Taylor Greene is one, you know, future face of the Republican Party, is Carrie Lake uh, another one, even though that she lost the governor race in, in Arizona? Yeah. I, so both Green and Carrie Lake were made possible by Donald Trump. I mean, mm -hmm. they very much followed the template that he set of um, sort of performative right-wing politics. Carrie Lake is in many ways the apotheosis of that as a person mm -hmm. who'd been in media right. for two decades and then used that much in a way of a, I'm just thinking about this now, of, of like a, you know, um, a some guy who, you know, uh, was an incorrigible drunk and beat his wife and all that, suddenly repenting and then becoming yeah. a pastor and essentially using his bedrock of sin uh, uh, to uh, claim that he understands the beast better than anyone mm -hmm. else. Carrie Lake is that person. Now, I, to briefly answer your question about Lake's future, I still think she has one. And I think people who, I mean, for someone who, as someone who saw her at close range, um, she's on a certain level mesmerizing just on a performative level. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, no one kind of hits the mark quite like yeah. she does. Um, but Arizona, um, you're right, Nick, is, I mean, it's a, it is, it, it's a subject of fascination to me because it's a, it's, uh, now it's lost, um, the governorship uh, to mm -hmm. the democratic party. Both of its senators are, uh, are democratic. Right. The legislature is barely in control of the Republicans by literally like a couple of legislators. And so with those trends in mind, you'd think that the Republican Party there would do well to take stock of them and uh, and endeavor to, um, you know, expand the tent, as it were. They've done the opposite. They've, they've doubled down on right wing extremism. And as you mentioned, the, the Barry Goldwater and then later John McCain have been viewed as kind of the faces of the Republican Party. It's always been a little more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, Goldwater's wife was a co-founder of one of the chapters of Planned Parenthood. Yep. Um, but there were a lot of people on the right who didn't cut to that. They just mm -hmm. didn't have a kind of coherent movement going on. They couldn't stand um, McCain for saying, right. for referring to uh, uh, members of you know, the right wing religious movement as agents of intolerance. They couldn't mm -hmm. stand his immigration policies, uh, but they also couldn't quite get their power together. Now mm -hmm. they've managed to do so, and uh, we'll see how long it lasts there. But it's but I but that was the other reason why I was interested in Gosar and Green because they happen to be you know faces on two of these states that were. Um, quasi-determinative right. in 2020 um, and states where clearly uh, the trends are moving at least somewhat away from the Republican Party, mm -hmm. uh, but you wouldn't know it to see um, uh, uh, to see the Republican Party's and in, behavior. In Arizona, it's amazing, too, because you have a very successful and popular two-term governor, Doug Ducey, who you know, he's not a libertarian, but he's he's a kind of centrist Republican for sure. Mm, yeah. And he could have won that Senate race that Blake Masters lost. He could have won by double digits without breaking yeah. a sweat, but he couldn't be the candidate because Donald Trump hated him because Doug Ducey, like an adult human being, refused to say things that were obviously false about the election right. and things like that. And so- that gets to, you know, in a way, I mean, Kevin McCarthy, who is likely to become the next Speaker of the House, who is Kevin McCarthy and why does he matter so much in weapons of mass delusion? Sure. Kevin McCarthy was elected to office in 2006 to Congress from Bakersfield, California. Previous to that, he had been a staff aide to um, Bill Thomas, who had held that seat for a very long time. McCarthy, utterly non-ideological, um, <clears throat> not much of a belief system at all, 
very ambitious uh, fellow, uh, seething with ambition, uh, as I say in the book. So um, he doesn't have time actually, for ideology or policy, no, right? Because it's, no it's, uh, yeah, 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 it's yeah, like yeah, I'm yeah. taken over by ambition. Right. But also, you know, has a head um, the way, you know, some data geeks have a head for baseball statistics, has a head for precinct by precinct politics, uh, and, um, uh, and had from his early 20s been infatuated with Donald Trump. And uh, so um, he has risen in the ranks. He was I covered him during the, the Tea Party period when he was the majority whip in the House. And he and was one of the so-called young guns, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. Younger, with, Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor. Eric Cantor. That's and right. There yeah, one more? And, there might, but they're no, all gone. Yeah, okay, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. They're all gone. And McCarthy's been the survivor, and this has been his moment. In fact, he said to a confidant, you know, recognizing the, how the historical um, trends tend to favor the party out of power in um, the, the party with power in their first term of uh, right. the president's first term of office. He, you know, he said to a confidant, you know, the upside to Biden winning is now I have a pretty good shot of being speaker. And yeah. now that appears to be the case, though, with a absolute razor thin um, uh, majority. The, why is he salient? Not just because of that, but also because of, um, uh, as you say, he would seem to be the face of the adult in the room, Republican, and yet really is the face of, uh, of the enabling of the MAGA movement, because he, he made the determination after January the 6th that um, as much as he was literally frightened for his life, actually said to Trump on the phone, they're fucking trying to kill me, as I report yeah. in my book. That, that, um, that the Republicans couldn't exist, the House Republicans could not prosper without um, the blessings of Trump because of his, his hold over uh, the base. And so he very famously went to Mar-a-Lago and, mm -hmm. and been to the knee um, and in other ways has coddled Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul mm -hmm. Gosar, uh, and, uh, uh, and really behaved himself um, like, if not a right-wing extremist himself, one who was far more approving of them than of, say, Liz Cheney, everybody else's idea of a, you know, a solid conservative who nonetheless right. um, uh, was outraged by Trump's conduct and, and um, how he yeah. en had enabled uh, what happened on January the 6th. Uh, so McCarthy, basically, when I described, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene going up, Liz Cheney going down, yeah. there was McCarthy very much um, kind of like the matador with a cape, mm -hmm. you know, letting each of them happen. Um, what does it say that, you know, let's assume he becomes Speaker of the House. In the 21st century, the least objectionable Republican speaker might be a convicted child molester, Dennis, Dennis Haster, you know, that, or, or most effective. I mean, it's, it's bizarre yeah. and insane. And obviously, it's weird because I'm not a fan of Nancy Pelosi, but she is an effective Speaker of the House. Like, obviously... That job is one of the worst jobs to have, and she's yep. able to do it in a way, you know, that traditionally there have been a couple of others like that. But that's yeah, yeah. And yeah. of course, we'll see what happens once she vacates leadership. Mm -hmm. And I have no, you know, intel as to when that will occur. But whether um, the more um, extreme elements in the Democratic Party uh, begin to create yeah. the kind of havoc. That the Marjorie Taylor Greens and Paul Gosars and Matt Gates have done uh, in the Republican Party, but it certainly is the case, as you're indicating, that, that she has tamped those down. Pelosi has whatever one thinks of her belief system. Um, she has wielded power um, very formidably. Right, and she has kept, uh, you know, kind of AOC and her posse and some of the more progressive Democrats in a, in a pen. I mean, she's corralled them in a way. Uh, and there were a lot of stories when they first started rising about the way that she kind of backhanded them. But she's a short term or whether it's because they go into the minority or, you know, there are a lot of reports she'll be leaving uh, to become ambassador to the Vatican or whatever. You know, I mean, she's 80. Uh, you know, these right. people, you know, I realize if you're in the Bay Area, you, you have blood boys and stuff like that. So, you know, but eventually they give up. Right. Um, right. Do, do you, do you, uh, let's talk a little bit about how the midterms affect what you're talking about in the book, because, mm -hmm. you know, by all accounts, the Republicans should have won between 30 and 60 right. seats in the House. They should have sure. picked up five or 10 seats in the Senate. That didn't happen. But the, you know, the House is going to be Republican. The Senate is almost certainly going to be Democrat, but it's going to be very tight. Um, 
How does this, and Trump has just as, you know, just a few hours before we talked, whenever this goes out, Trump announced that he's running for president in 2024. Right. His guys lost in a pretty significant way across the board. I mean, there were the secretaries of states who denied the 2020 election. They all lost with one exception, the guy in Wyoming. Um, his preferred candidates, his Senate candidates, somebody like Blake Masters, uh, somebody like Herschel Walker, somebody like Mehmet Oz. These are people who lost or, you know, Walker may still eke out a victory, but they, it's clear his chosen people, the bigger the race, the bigger the bomb that they were. Um, you know, JD Vance in Ohio won and, you know, after spectacularly kissing, you know, Trump's ass and, and being humiliated by him at public rallies as a former critic, et cetera. But it seems that Trump, you know, he may, you know, in terms of the midterm elections, like he can't be coming out of this uh, more powerful. And does that change the calculus of what you're writing about in the book? The short answer is no. So that's, um, I mean, uh, as my book makes clear, um, Trump and Trumpism have never been popular mm -hmm. and, and never popular across the board to a general electorate. And given the opportunity to express that distaste for Trump and Trumpism, the general electorate will do so. It has mm -hmm. done so time and again, right. and it did so yet again. Yeah, we the know, we is, know definitively, you know, and again, I'm a, I'm an election believer, I guess, but that yeah. he can get about 46% of the popular vote. That's what he did in two, right. you know, uh, you know, consecutive elections. Like he's not going to get 54% the next time out. That's right. Yeah. So, so, you know, the, the question with Trump and Trumpism has always been um, uh, what effect they have on the Republican Party. There is, mm -hmm. an, ins there is an additional question, um, perhaps you know, just as significant, which is that um, as long as Trump and Trumpism have a hold on the Republican Party, what kind of damage can they do to the country, even in the face of defeat, right? And, and so January the 6th being one you know, expression of that one manifestation, but uh, you know, and the other um, sort of more lingering one is the tens of millions of people who believe these delusions, who believe these lies, um, not just relating to um, stolen elections, not just relating to January the sixth, but also relating to uh, COVID, relating to um, uh, the Great Replacement theory, you know, and, and what's happening on the border or what's not happening. Uh, and, um, but, you know, I, I do think speaking directly to, you know, what the midterms tell us about Trump. Look, I mean, I, um, uh, people are now, you know, saying DeSantis is, is you know, the, um, has got the inside mm -hmm. track and that may well be so, but I also well remember, and you do too, that, um, when you and I were talking about Rand Paul in the context of libertarianism and presidential politics, a lot of other people were talking about Scott Walker as the mm -hmm. great hope of the Republican Party because he also, uh, the um, conservatives loved him for how he stood up to the press, how he stood up yeah. to the unions and busted them, uh, did everything a conservative you'd want a conservative to do except campaign well, and he was a dud. We really yeah. have no sense whatsoever how DeSantis will do, right. even as a standalone proposition. But it's an altogether different thing to see DeSantis against the human wrecking ball that is Donald Trump. Right. And Donald Trump cleared out what, I mean. It was we, amazing. We I mean, say, yeah, he had what, yeah. like 16 or 17, yeah, yeah. you they know, were, plausible you know, they, Republicans. I mean, there were not, it wasn't a bunch of clowns on the show. I mean, it was, exactly. you know, Jeb Bush That's to Rand right. Paul to Ted Cruz, et cetera. Yeah, and, and people forget that. They think yeah. they, you know, today it's it's thought that they all must have been a bunch of weak sisters. No, yeah. they were not. I mean, those were, that that was really a dream slate of, you know, yeah. uh, of the deepest bench. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I think of DeSantis. I mean, it remains to be seen, and I'm not sure actually how much I care about this, but he also reminds me of Chris Christie, who also was very effective in New Jersey, stood up to unions publicly, played well in New York and New Jersey. And, you know, I'm from that area, and I, I, I was a columnist for Time at the time, and I wrote about how Christie plays great in that area, but there's no way, like, once you cross the Delaware River West, he's, people are yeah. going to be like, who is this fat fuck loudmouth? Right. I don't know if- But the I thing mean, is, like, after, the, after Trump's announcement speech, I mean, so much focus- perhaps unsurprisingly yeah. in the media where, oh, the people in the room were bored. Oh, it was right. the same thing over and over. They're missing the point, yeah. which is the point being that for the MAGA constituents, the same old song is exactly what they yeah. want to hear. It's the I greatest mean, it's, They don't want to yeah. hear the slightest deviation. Right. 
Um, so let me, so that will play out. What is the effect of Trump or MAGA, you know, for as, as a shorthand for a broader movement? What is the effect of that on the Democratic Party? Because, you know, and it's weird because Biden, uh, the, the Washington Post, and I think they were accurate about this when they, they said that Joe Biden's presidential platform was the most liberal a Democrat had ever run on. He was talking about $11 trillion in new spending. He seemed normal because he was running against Trump, but he's not just a kind of big government Democrat, but he, and he got a lot of what he wanted. He is not popular. He is also being, you know, attacked from the left in the Democratic Party. I mean, you know, the, the younger generation of Democrats, they hate MAGA, but they're also sick of, um, you know, of, of Joe Biden and of Nancy Pelosi and of, you know, a, a centrist Senate stuff. You know, they like Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Do you think, how does that play out, particularly after the midterms? Do the de Democrats, you know, is there going to be, do you think there'll be an insurgency on the progressive side of Democrats to say, this is our moment um, because this isn't cutting it, what we're seeing going on now? Yeah. I mean, I um interesting to, to, to hear you ask that question because I've talk to some progressive leaders who do believe that they're making inroads right mm -hmm. now with the Biden administration. Yeah. And this, I mean, in a way they um, are, they're getting a lot of spending and a lot sure. of the things Absolutely. that they want, but not and quite. The belief as is that, the, the, you know, this will benefit the public, but even if the public doesn't come to see it, their aversion mm -hmm. to Trump is so deep and abiding that that will overcome whatever deficiencies they may see in yeah. Biden. <laughs> I mean, meanwhile, you know, it's it's not entirely clear that Biden will run again. I mean, I, I did happen to notice you know, the day after the midterms when Biden kind of did his victory lap of a speech that when asked, um, he said on at least two occasions, my intention is to run, which is very different from just saying declaratively, right. I'm running you know, mofo. And and, uh, uh, and that kind of language, you know, you and I have heard in Washington forever. And it's it's wiggle room for a reason and leads mm -hmm. me to believe that maybe over the holidays, he and his family will discuss all this. I mean, <laughs> he's on top of whatever else, you know, we've been talking about regarding Biden. He's quite old. And, and um, yeah. so is Nancy Pelosi, but yeah, Nancy yeah. Pelosi seems to be quite, you know, vigorous and quite effective right, right. in, in Mitch, what she does. Mitch McConnell, um, also ancient by yeah. political say. I mean, I keep thinking back to those pictures of, you know, Soviet, uh, you know, apparatchiks in the in the 70s and 80s. And you're like, God, they were so old. And it's like, you know, Brezhnev was in his 50s. And right. it's like no, we have people no. 30 years older than him running the country. Um, yeah. If I may also, um, you know, uh, what do you think that this rhetoric of stolen elections and rigged systems, et cetera? And again, I think back to 2016, Hillary was saying a version of it. Bernie Sanders was Trump was. And uh, again, not to make them all equivalent, but there's a palpable sense throughout much of America. And this this undergirded and powered the Black Lives Matter movement, right? That, you know, like it doesn't matter if, if you're black in America and you work hard and you play by the rules, you're still going to be killed by cops. You're not going to get ahead. There's racism, you know, and then there's a, a kind of deindustrialized Midwestern version of that. There is a Latino version of there's, you know, uh, as we speak, there's a Supreme Court case about Asians, Asian Americans being kept out of Harvard and, and U University of North Carolina and elite institutions. There's a real palpable sense that the system is broken or the systems are broken. And Hillary Clinton, who I guess doesn't really have many divisions anymore, but she, in a recent fundraising appeal for a group called Indivisible, talked about how, uh, you know, in the pitch, she says extreme right wing conservatives have a plan to disallow the, you know, to win the 2024 election, to steal the election, and we need to crush the coup. That's the actual language for this fundraising appeal. Do you think that kind of election denialism is going to go kind of mainstream or ubiquitous or end more and more disintegration of belief or cynicism towards any kind of major institution, major undertaking over the next few years? Yeah. I mean, I will say, you know, I, first, I think that, you know, crush the coup is is at minimum really, really ill-advised, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, rhetorically. Um, but but I, I do recognize because as a reporter, as a citizen who follows the news, 
you can hear Republican state legislators say out loud that their intention is, in fact, to make it more difficult yeah. for um, certain constituencies to vote. And some of them have said explicitly, because of our efforts to do these kinds of things, we Republicans are going to win more. And right. so they they themselves are casting it as a partisan effort, yeah. regardless of whether you know this is um, a you know systematized. Um, carefully orchestrated yeah. thing here and there it's certainly the truth i mean you know what you're referring to nick is is a is a larger distrust you know the, the distrust of institutions goes back to vietnam obviously mm -hmm. you know then, and then watergate but it, it has gotten to a point now where the view is is not just that uh institutions are hoary and and have their own kind of inertia um but that they act at, at minimum um, are uh, dismissive of, of ordinary Americans and at maximum uh, are contemptuous of and, and deceptive towards. And are killing and, them and eating them. I mean, right. in some yeah, cases, yeah. I mean, literally. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. And it's, and uh, I, I don't know where and how that ends. I mean, it's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to referring to Marjorie Taylor Greene to see her now, I and mean, she has expressed to me that she actually wishes to be taken more seriously and to govern seriously. She's willing mm -hmm. to like let her actions speak for themselves. Um, and there she was, uh, you know, uh, standing with Kevin McCarthy the other day, um, saying how you know um, Republicans need to get in line and, and back him for speaker. Something I wouldn't have expected her to do before. Mm -hmm. But when the rubber meets the road, the question will be. Um, you, you know, are, are you going to like try to govern responsibly while at the same time um, having endless investigations of your political enemies? And right. um, uh, so, uh, uh, so we'll you know we'll see if you know someone like Green um, tries to reform the institutions from within or continually cast them as demon figures. As a, a kind of final uh, uh, point to this conversation, you're a Texas guy. And you open the book with, um, I think, a particularly uh, important and, and moving, but, you know, important um, uh, discussion of your father who died, I guess, during COVID, right? Yeah, he died in uh, uh, November yeah. 2019, just before COVID. And, okay, and, just uh, before yeah. COVID. But, and it was a lifelong Republican in a kind of Texas way, which I take to be um, that, you know, is is a kind of... Uh, you know, smaller government, uh, you know, a, a small government kind of live and let live yeah. kind of Republican, right? Uh, right. An older style um, who was contemptuous of Trump. But, you know, is there, do you think like the, the kind of politics, his politics that emerge, which seem to be, you know, broadly speaking, you know, kind of socially tolerant, fiscally responsible, um, I don't know that that actually adds up to being libertarian in any meaningful way, and I don't really care about that. But that idea um, where, you know, you you have a government that you don't want to do everything, but you want it to do certain things, and you believe that it can do those, and you'll support that. And you also think that people and businesses should mostly be left to their own devices. Um, you know, that immigration is good, that free trade is good, that movement is good, and, you know, and people need to change and grow. Is there um, is there a path forward for that kind of politics, given what we're seeing emerging kind of on an extreme right where, you know, national conservatives are, you know, somebody like a Blake Masters said libertarianism doesn't work and that the government really needs to be controlling things. Ron DeSantis says we need to use the power of the state to go after our enemies the way the left does. Uh, people on the progressive caucus are talking about taking over, nationalizing social media and platforms like that. Is, you know, is the the country that your father lived in, is that gone forever or is that a viable kind of synthesis of what comes out of these moments of madness of the past half dozen years or so? I do think that um, maybe even the majority of Republican office holders embrace the views that my dad did, which, yeah, I think distill them distill themselves down to um you know, healthy distrust of government, less government, lower taxes, emphasis on personal responsibility, um, uh, and um, uh, and would love to see that the beast that they have, at least implicitly, if not explicitly, fed uh, for years will uh, will eat itself. The, the the one you know important ingredient to my father that I mentioned 
in the preface of my book is that um, he, uh, personal responsibility to him meant um, never making excuses, never um, uh, uh, being a professional victim, and certainly never um, demonizing the other side. After all, that would have made it very difficult for him to stay happily married like he was um, uh, for 64 years to my mother, who was a Democrat and who cheerfully you know, cancel his vote out every election cycle. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Ron DeSantis becomes more of um, my father's kind of Republican, but only um, if he divests himself of this rhetoric that casts um, uh, wokeism as, as, you know, the liberals as possessed by wokeism, possessed by radical socialist ideas, and basically people who must be punished, who must be ground to dust. And, and uh, uh, you know, my dad was always of the view, and Republicans were really for a very long time until Trump showed them a different way of, um, of trying to persuade people that, that their way was a better way. Now, I'm not in, you know, I'm not in any way idealizing um, conservatism back in my father's day, since it yeah. was a table around which sat almost exclusively, you know, white men. And, uh, and, uh, and you've written more than one book on, on the Bushes, particularly George W. Bush yeah. as incurious and in, in profound ways of failed presidents. I mean, you're not a Republican apologist by any stretch. No, no. And it's, and, um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, they, it was the, um, you know, the group think, um, and the confirmation bias, uh, uh, and the very, very limited worldview that George W. Bush had that was a big contributor to the disaster that was the Iraq war. And, um, yeah. my father loved George W. Bush, but came over the years to believe that he had been led astray by his own biases and his own incuriosity. And I think that informed in turn how my father, you know, came to seek out alternative points of view too. So I, I don't, I, I'm by nature, not a very prescriptive person. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and so I don't know how one comes back to that, but do I think that, you know, the, um, that the opportunity is there and that the numbers are there amongst Republicans? Yes. My greater concern is that when you have so many millions of people who um, are possessed by delusions and, the, and, and that underpinning those delusions is the belief that the other side is, is satanic, um, then I don't know how you come back to, well, you know, look, we still need to work across the aisles with those people we yeah. disagree with. I mean, it's, you, you don't work across the aisle with them. Marjorie Taylor Greene was actually quite honest when she was asked as, as a candidate uh, uh, running for uh, Congress, uh, if she would ever walk across the aisle, and and she basically said no. She said no. That's um, because uh, we just have to defeat them. We can't persuade them. Uh, mm -hmm. They're they're for things we abhor, and um, that was a kind of zero sum language that just didn't exist during my father's era of Republican mm -hmm. politics. Do you think, though, then maybe it is a little bit heartening and for God's sake, nobody wants to, you know, pin the hopes of the Republic on Marjorie Taylor Greene, but the fact that she seems to be more accommodating, um, particularly if she becomes part of a majority that is very small um, and actually to do anything will have to actually work with other people. I have a wait and see attitude about Greene yep. because it depends on whether, I mean, it's um, to to try to govern a certain way, but still to be tweeting and and on right wing media saying uh, these kinds of things about you know the killings have already begun. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I don't care if she wants to you know raise the debt ceiling. I mean, I do care, but if she's saying that kind of stuff too, then she's feeding delusions and feeding this apocalyptic mm -hmm. you know fever. Uh, so um, I understand that one reason she does that is to get attention and to get attention means to get online donations and to get online donations means to become a national figure. Um, but at a certain point she has a choice to make because those two come in conflict and Paul Gosar is one case in point of how they come in conflict. Right. All right. We're going to leave it there. The book is weapons of mass delusion. When the Republican party lost its mind, the author is Robert Draper. Robert, thanks so much for talking. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Nick.